the middle listen is is my uh, number one favorite. You can't control what the other others do but if you do your hard work and you're doing everything you can it it will happen sometime in the beginning of the the season I, my goal was just to to come to one uh, world cup yeah. this is the cutest orienteering video i have ever seen <laughs> so that so that's porridge but yeah. but that's where i was going you you eat it with salt don't you yeah uh, we do that, that's don't. something no <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, this is Tom again from Into the Forest I Go. Today I'm going to have a wonderful chat probably uh, with Hannah Lundberg. And if this, if this is your first time to the channel, this is an orienteering channel where uh, we do our best to share the orienteering knowledge and learn about this beautiful sport of running with the map and compass. But also we're trying to have some fun along the way. And I think today's chat is going to be a little bit of both. So welcome, Hannah. Very nice to have you here with me. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Yeah. So uh, Hannah has just came back from a quite long training camp um, connected with the World Cup. Uh, so she's enjoying her time at home. And I've prepared some questions around her career, both in orienteering, but also cross-country skiing, which is uh, not so often... Uh, when it comes to runners that are doing orienteering, that they also do the cross-country skiing, at least at the same quite high level, I would say, as Hannah is doing. So this is the theme of our talk mostly, but we are also going to have some fun and I will be poking around uh, some other interesting areas. Uh, so basically anything that inspires me, I'll just uh, dive into that. But we also have a list of questions that we will try to go through and... Um, it will probably, as usually, last about one hour. So let's get right into it. Uh, the first one I have is, how did you start practicing orienteering and cross-country skiing as a child? Where does this passion for those two sports come from? Um, we have, a, and I'm from a quite um, active family. I mean, we have always been hiking in the mountains and been outside and in the forest and so, but my family aren't any orienteering or cross-country skiing from family from the start. Uh, we um, we are from Luleå, which is a place very high up in the north in Sweden. So we have a lot of snow in the winters. And oh. um, my neighbor came when I was six years old and told us about uh, the great uh, cross-country skiing club that was uh, just one kilometer away from home. Uh, so uh, that's the way we started cross-country skiing. And, all of uh, you as a family? Uh, yeah, I think all of all, all oh, my family got included. Uh -huh. It was me and my brother that was on the trainings, but my um, mom and dad has always been supporting and uh, followed us. And uh, in, I mean, in cross country skiing, you need a supporting family that uh, can drive the car and vex the skis and uh, so on. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it was so so fun just to be there because it was we just played on the skis and the coaches were. We're just letting us having fun, no, no pressure and so. And uh, I found friends that I still have connect, a, a really good connection with. So uh, I guess it's from there the cross country skiing career started, and uh, then the orienteering uh, came from the cross country skiing club too because it's the same coaches. Uh, and uh, when it was summer and the the cross country skiing uh, trainings uh, stopped. We went over to orienteering uh, directly. Okay, so you kind of started with cross country skiing, then we you went into orienteering, but you're still doing both at the same time. So this cross country skiing some somehow stayed with you. Yeah, absolutely. Now. So when when the snow came at the autumns, we <laughs> we picked up the skis and uh, just uh, it was the same group, so it was no no big difference. Okay, all right. So let's. I, I'm really curious about this cross country skiing as well. Not because I'm a great um, fan of the sport. I mean, I, I actually like the sport, and we always have a training camp during winter where we go with uh, our club uh, somewhere towards either uh, Polish mountains or, or Czech mountains, and we do like uh, at least one week of cross country skiing. Whenever I have an opportunity to do cross country skiing here where I live, uh, I also do that. But recently, we are getting quite a lot of little snow, really, during winters. It's getting warmer and warmer, <laughs> so it's not that easy anymore. 
Uh, my wife loves it and she's actually quarreling uh, sometimes with her coach because she just wants to go out and do one week or two weeks of just skiing uh, all the time without any running. And there's also always a discussion whether it's good for her preparation for the next season or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it is an interesting topic for me, especially because um, you, you tend to do um, really well in both areas. So, so I want to dig a little bit deeper into this cross country area cross-country skiing area. So uh, last year we achieved podiums and victories in cross-country skiing in Bauhaus Sweden Cup, right? Yes, that's uh, right. So uh, did you expect this excellent performance in cross-country skiing back then? No, I had no idea. Uh, my plan was just to go to some com competitions and see what it, what it would lead to and because it's fun. Um, I thought that I didn't hadn't done the work during the summer that was needed, like uh -huh. roller skiing into walls. And I, I, I don't do that, but I thought it was necessary. But uh, obviously it uh, wasn't. So it was just fun when I uh, go the first cup in uh, Idefjell at, uh, I guess it was just before Christmas. Uh, and then I saw like, whoa, okay, this is going quite fast. And I haven't done so much cross country skiing training yet. <laughs> I, mean, I just come came from the... Uh, from the running season so then I uh, tried like okay but if I change some some of my sessions to cross-country scene sessions and uh, try to be more uh, more focused on the sessions then it I will want to see what it leads what it would lead to and uh, that uh, that was a really nice job to do yeah and and then uh, I guess you became part of the national team or maybe even some years earlier uh, but you definitely went to the junior world cup in cross country skiing right uh, yeah this was my first uh, time i i had done some junior events for team sweden before but it was just like the nordic countries and this was my yeah. first time with the, the real uh, national junior team okay and uh, how did you do how how did you feel i mean i know how you, how you did but how how do you feel about those places are you happy with those um, i mean the medals weren't really that far away do you think they were reachable yeah, I, when I w uh, went there, I knew that okay, I'm, I've done it really good in Sweden, but this is it's like next level, and uh, it was a tough situation because I mean, all my cross country skiing friends had uh, just hold their plan of the year towards this goal, and I yeah. just adjusted the last few weeks. I knew that okay, maybe I won't have that shape that they are having, but I think I can can go quite far with just uh strong mental uh, uh mentality and uh just try try and see how what it would lead to yeah so it was way outside my comfort zone and of course i'm happy and satisfied with what i achieved when you think of what i've done during the summer and autumn but preparations right Season. yeah exactly but when you're a competitive person it's always like you want always something more and when the medals were that close it's yeah i i i think i would say i want more but at the same time i'm quite satisfied all right but i also say that you are the competitive person aren't you yeah i am and i <laughs> try to work with that to be satisfied even though someone else does it better because that's something i can't uh affect all right uh, so I'm going to share a short story with you, with you and everybody else, because I think it might be relevant. Um, last weekend, we had a Polish champs um, event, and I, I've been a little bit hopeful about this event because my, my I, I'm not a top orienteering runner, and, and I've never been one. Uh, but uh, I'm running in master's class now, and my, my goal is to get the, the gold medal at every type of the race in somewhere in the master's classes. So I have long, I have middle, I have sprint, I have the relay. Um, well, there are two relays now, right? Because there's a sprint relay and a forest relay. Um, yeah, and, th and there is also an ultra long in Poland. So so that's my goal. I want to get gold medals from all of them. And it, it doesn't have to be now, it's just somewhere in, in time, right? So I have, I have one from, from long, I have one from uh, the relay. And this weekend, I was oh, I hope I also have one from the night orienteering. We also have night champs. Uh, so this weekend was night orienteering and middle orienteering, and I was really hoping that um, I'm I'm going to fight for the gold medal on the middle distance. That was basically my goal for the weekend. But at the same time, I knew that the competition is pretty decent as well. 
and it's not going to be given to me on a silver platter. So I have to fight for it. And even though I've been struggling with quite a lot of injuries during the season, I felt that I'm suddenly uh, gaining speed and I feel pretty confident in the forest, uh, both with the speed and, and the orienteering. So I thought, okay, I have, I have a chance. But, you know, I'm also working with, uh, with the youth and very often we are talking about how to handle this kind of expectation. So at, the, at, at one point, um, I would say that I'm pretty competitive as well. So I want to reach out for, for this top place. This is my goal for the competition, right? But at the same time, I'm usually telling people that when you're setting the goals, the goals shouldn't be to aim at the top spot. You should actually um, create goals that are dependent on what you are able to do, uh, right? That they, they can't be dependent entirely on whatever um, is happening around you. And definitely the performance of the, your competition is exactly that, right? You can't control this. Uh, so um, even though I had this top place in mind, uh, my real goal was to actually perform as well as possible. So I wanted to push hard. And at the same time, I wanted to do uh, very few mistakes during the race. And when I actually came back from the middle distance, I was really happy with the race. And th this is like kind of um, answering to what you've mentioned. I think that when, when I get this feeling, I can't feel dissatisfied with my result. When I come back from the forest and I feel like I've been pushing hard, I've made very little mistakes and there is not much more, or maybe there isn't anything else that I could have done today. The result doesn't matter because I'm already happy with whatever, uh, whatever comes. And I placed second. So of course there is a, there is a little bit of a disappointment always, right? But at the same time, if I feel that I did my best at that, at that, that particular event for that particular day, it's hard to feel sorry about it, really, right? Yes, I totally agree, and I had this, exactly the same feeling during this World Cup uh, final, uh, the middle distance. It was like a terrain that didn't fit me, I, or I I've never tried that terrain before, so I, I didn't know what to expect. And then I like did a really, really good race and came to finish and was quite satisfied or really satisfied. But then the one girl after the other came and ran faster. So it was, and then yeah, I felt that disappointment coming and I felt like, oh my God, come on. You, <laughs> I knew that okay, I, I need to change this mindset, but, but it's so hard uh, there and that. Yeah, but uh, as you, very well known, and we'll get to it probably later. You can't control what the competition does, right? So as long no, as you're exactly, satisfied with exactly. yourself. And I thought about when you mentioned your goal that you want to take a, a gold medal uh, in every edition, uh, in every distance, but it doesn't matter what year. I think it's the right way to see at it because you can't control what the other, others do. But if you do your hard work and you're doing everything you can, it it will happen sometime. But yeah, maybe, I, mean, I still maybe have not like, this year or next year, but yeah, you have I still so have many like 40 years or 50 <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to go. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's move on. Uh, so uh, what do you think about skiing technique in, in both classing and skating? What is your strong point? Is it, is it the technique or is it your mental capacity to push hard or is it your physical pre pre preparation? Uh, I think it's the, the overall... Uh, capacity not uh, technique um okay. i mean the more likely running the technique is the better i go <laughs> like uh, cross like classic techniques uh, uphill it's the best for me because then you use your heart and you uh, do it's, it's the most same similar to running. just foot running right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i have to say <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's perfect and and then i'm quite tall so uh, if you have a, a hill that's not too steep, it's perfect because then I can use my legs to to uh, go faster than others up there. Yeah, so I have the same. Um, I've started practicing skating technique like two years ago. Um, last year, actually for the training camp that I mentioned before, I rented the, the skis for, for skating technique and I, I was uh, really determined to use only those during the training camp. And, and I think I did. I think I did. Uh, so uh, I, I felt I felt that I got a grip on how to how to skate, but I also at the same time uh, saw a tremendous difference between how I'm doing it and how, for example, the top guys from the Czech orienteering uh, ski team are doing it. Right? I I feel that the the, the, 
the difference in the in the speed of how they get about the controls in the forest of the map while skiing at the same time and between them and me is like <laughs> huge yeah <laughs> yeah but i think that for some some people it just don't fall natural to do skating <laughs> and for others it does so it's uh we are different i think yes that's just the way it is <laughs> yeah and and the thing i struggled with i wanted to ask this about uh, for from you so the thing i struggled with is that um yeah so because i i am a beginner at it uh, there's no other way of putting it right so i've been mostly practicing it for one week so i've been practicing different motions and, and there are different ways you can go about skating on your skis right so you can use both arms at the same time uh, you can uh, use it every with every leg or every second leg uh, but you can also do this motion when you're doing like right so one arm goes um, first and the, and the other one just follows close close by um, and the legs are doing the same they are not symmetric as well um, and I felt that this is the easiest one for me to master at the beginning. Um, I think that because it allowed me to keep my balance the, the best. It was easier yeah, for, it, for, for the balance. Yeah, it's uh, true. The, you, you often have a lower speed when you're doing, we call it year year two in Sweden. I don't know if it's the same in, uh, in, no, in English, no. but uh, I know what, what you mean. But uh, yeah, it's because it's easier to have the balance and uh, it often goes, yeah. I, you use it I often when you go a little bit. When you're going with both arms, you can kind of just have to, for a moment, you have to stand on one leg. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you need and to, then, to use and then it and, you... and stand a long time on the leg to. Yeah. And, and then if you, if you push a little bit too hard, yeah. and I'm standing on this one leg and I get no <laughs> yeah. more on that side. <laughs> exactly. So that happens like... a lot of times. <laughs> And you need to do this small jumps on the ski that yeah. you're standing on. To oh, fall. <laughs> really? I don't think yeah, I've been doing all that. The time. <laughs> Especially now when we are going to change from roller skis to cross country skis again. Uh, this <laughs> that's that's a challenge. I think I'm usually trying to save myself with with my sticks. They are called sticks. In yeah. Right? So poles <laughs> yeah, maybe. but it's hard when you go fast that you're gonna yeah. move the, <laughs> the poles away. It's, yeah. It's so hard so enough, I, uh, I have fresh. been falling a lot trying, practicing yeah. that. Um, I got a grip of it, uh, but at, at the same time, I feel like this is. Uh, unsymmetrical motion was a little bit easier but at the same time when I've been doing it for a few days I started to feel the pain in my back uh, one side definitely was working harder than the other side and my left butt cheek I think was hurting uh, and right butt cheek was totally fine uh, so probably the answer to this is that you have to mix it right and you have to do it on one side and maybe on the yes. other side as well so exactly we have uh, like you often have a favorite side that leads the movement, but uh, we practice both sides to be symmetric. And uh, when uh, we're working with technique, we want to, even though we have like the right side first, we want to have them as symmetric as possible because, I mean, we need to use both sides to go as fast as possible forward. As, but, but at the same time, I've noticed that I'm a bit stronger on my right side than the left side. And uh, the right side is my favorite uh, for going uphill so maybe it's, it has a part of why I have some injuries on the just the same side because it's it's not 100% symmetric mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's more or less what I figured after the few days and feeling the pain I started practicing on the other side and again it was super awkward at the beginning I couldn't yeah do it. <laughs> it's, it's so hard and I'm, I've done it for like five six seven years and i still don't really get it so so when i compete i always do the same side <laughs> yeah but at the same time I, I like learning new things so it was i, I treated it like a challenge okay i can yeah. do it on one side let's try to learn it on the other side and it was exactly fine. it can't be an uh, it can't be impossible yeah exactly all right let's let's move a little bit to the orienteering part um you had a great j-walk last year uh, but I didn't spot you in Portugal this year. And I, I even scrolled through the results uh, yesterday to make sure that you weren't there. And you weren't there, right? No, I weren't there. I have uh, had an injury during the whole year so or the whole summer. Uh, so I missed both Book, J-Book, Wooding and Aok. So it has been a, a really, really tough summer. Yeah, that was my suspicion. What happened? Um, I guess it was when I came from the, or maybe you can say it started at the uh, Junior World Ski Championships. Um, I couldn't run as much as I wanted. And when you want to have that uh, taken step by step and um, 
run more and more. Uh, mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that when I was at the championships. So uh, I started to run on the hard sur surface way too fast and uh, get an injury in the, it's a muscle or like a tendon that uh, is attached to the shin in the downer leg. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, attachment has been inflammated and it took a really long time before it, uh, before I could run again. How, how long is it is really a long time? couple of months mm, yeah I, I went home from uh, from book in the end of june i guess and uh, then i was away from uh, from running for like one and a half month or something and or one month and then i tried to step it up uh, step by step uh, but so it's not that long but it's in the really wrong time like yeah. i missed four championships or something so it's yeah 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 i know what you mean <laughs> yeah, so I, I had i had my share of injuries but um three months before the the race last week uh, last weekend i was able to train kind of normal so yeah it's, it was a little bit better yeah perfect <laughs> um all right so um last season though was really good for you, wasn't it? Right. It, it was. I, I, really I think. Good. I think the highlight of this season was your win during the World Cup medal distance. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that, in my opinion, this is the cutest orienteering video I have ever seen. <laughs> I see her. Yes. I was. Uh, I've seen it by myself, and it's. Uh, I'm happy. <laughs> I, can, I agree. <laughs> I, I tried to Google it yesterday even, and I, I I even saw it on Nine Gag, which is quite a popular site, right? Oh, I have no so, idea so, about that. I heard so, it was on TikTok, but I have no idea yeah, about that. So, so it's even on Nine Gag. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was really fun. And by the way, uh, when we were talking previously about not being able to control the competition, this is exactly what happened, right? You had a really solid race. But there were definitely uh, other runners that were able to do better, right? But they just made mistakes, which you were able exactly. to avoid. I mean, at the last TV speed, it was, I think I would just was third or something, fourth or fifth at the last TV speed. And then it, uh, I, I can't explain what happened because it was, it was too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, there were some tricky controls, really, right? There, there, there were some legs where, you were running through the forest and there, there wasn't really anything to uh, control the direction with. You had to no, exactly. run the compass, and we, right? We came from like the, the open landscape and then down to the forest. Yeah. Um, everyone the was part. tired in the head because it had been a challenging course and um, the control was like where it, the the forest get, um, what do you say, thick. Um, so um, it was a challenging control or a pair of or challenging controls. Yeah, it was quite easy to make a mistake over there. I totally yes. agree. But, you know, overall, you had a really good season. You placed third uh, in the World Cup ranking, right? Exactly. So that's an awesome achievement for a 19-year-old. Yeah, that so was way over my expectations. I When I, in the beginning of the, the season, I, my goal was just to, to come to one uh, World Cup and try to see and learn how it or it worked and then it i managed to do it to the european championships in the that was the first round and uh, yeah then i get a new chance and another and uh, so so i just uh, enjoyed enjoyed it yeah so congratulations on that uh, but you. my question is how much effort did it cost right well, how 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 much do, do you think that you really pushed hard during the preparation for the for that season or it just came to you naturally with, with some normal training sessions? Of course I did a lot of preparation and hard work towards it, but I don't think it was any special. I think it was a hard and um, like structured work through many years that was paid off. And um, yeah, I don't think it was any special like that. I. It just, just came talented. to me this year. It's, some year it happens for everyone if they try to work hard, and it happened quite fast for me. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often for nineteen-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but of course I, I'm uh, something I've done really well. But I don't, I don't think I can mention like one thing. There is a lot of um, pieces to to build this puzzle. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh... What do you love about orienteering? 
it's that it's so complex I, uh, that i mean you need to be 100 percent focused uh, physically uh, mentally technically everything needs to be on top to to perform you can't like if you compare it to cross country skiing uh, then it's just to you have a you have a track and you know that you're gonna go as fast as possible from a to b uh, and can't like you have the form you have for a day but in orienteering you actually can um can affect what you achieve uh, through uh, the mental uh, aspect yeah um so would you say that you like orienteering more than cross-country skiing because of that complexity yeah i i should say i do uh exactly <laughs> i i started to study in some weekend when i was 15 which is uh orienteering uh, gymnasium um and um I think I took a decision that orienteering is funnier when I started to study there. Okay. And is there something that in particular you you also like uh, about cross-country skiing or is it just like your fill-in activity during the off orienteering season? Mm, yeah, but I should say that it's... I love the winter too. Mm -hmm. Like the places you see when you do a long cross-country session is like unbelievable uh, you can go so far and see so much uh, but at the same time when you do this these competitions when you need to go as hard as you can until you can't stand until you want to throw up and all that that's that has a charm too <laughs> okay uh, I understand that completely but uh, not many people are able to push themselves that hard and want to really no, but I think it's uh, it has a charm. But uh, I I understand that it's I, not I know everyone that thinks so. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of feel the same. I think uh, I, I also like this feeling when you know that you gave your absolute best. I think I like it before it shows me the limit of myself and my body. Exactly, and, you, and it's nice to know that when you're at start line, you will do all you can and give all you have. Uh, that's and when you're reaching the the goal and have that feeling the last uh, the upcoming uh, hours it's it's unbelievable yeah exactly um if you were to name the benefits of cross-country skiing as a maybe supplement activity for an orienteering during winter what would you say is it worth exploring mm, yeah i think that the the season doesn't match each other for like 100 percent and the last cross-country skiing competitions are like in the middle of April and the mm -hmm. uh, interior season starts before that. Um, but of course you, you can choose which competition you want to go with. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard to have that like to get that running you want during the winter if you will compete because a competition takes like you have the day before when you need to rest and the, the competition day and then you're a bit tired the day after. Uh, so Maybe I should not say that the cross country skiing training by itself is a problem. That's just have, uh, that's just that's just good. But um, if you want to compete, you need to be a bit aware of the of that uh, problems. If you were to say how much running do you do during the winter season compared to skiing, what, mm, would, what would be the ratio? This winter, I should say that I had like one or two interval sessions running during every week and then um, maybe three or four calm sessions too so like 50 50 maybe mm -hmm. and when you're going skiing do you have uh, a favorite course around the place where you live or do you sometimes just go off into the country and sightsee uh, i often do uh, go at the same course where I live and to have like the quality of the tracks and so yeah that's what I thought you probably need that if, especially when you want to do a little bit faster session right exactly or skating session <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um so <clears throat> this takes me to the next next question which is which I'm really curious about so I've been wondering about this and uh, I think it has to be really hard so what I mean is <clears throat> you're doing orienteering and the orienteering season as you said starts somewhere in April um, and lasts basically until 
at least the end of September, right? Okay. So normally when we are doing orienteering training and we're preparing people to do orienteering, we end the season, uh, we do like uh, several weeks of um, rest, basically. And then we come back to the training, but the training uh, is picking up pace slowly, as you mentioned, and is getting more and more advanced closer to the season you go, right? So you start with longer runs and the runs are getting a little bit shorter, but faster. Well, there are different preparations, but basically you don't push hard all the way through the season. Uh, but in your case, if you're ending the orienteering season, but then right after the orienteering season comes the cross country season and they almost overlap perfectly, how do you do that to stay in shape all year? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question <laughs> because it's so complex. But I think that if you start in like November or October when the orienteering season ends, um, I take like one week off to just do what whatever I want to. It's I, I doesn't sit in the sofa all the day, but uh, I don't need to be that structured. And uh, after that week, I often feel like okay, now I want to to have a have a plan again. So then I start the um, the winter training or what to call it, and uh, I train as the most hours during the winter and often concentrated in November, December, January. Um, because of the that the cross country skiing season is come uh, we, then we have the most important uh, competitions in February and March. And uh, my like goal is to have uh, the same uh, hard sessions uh, every week. So or not the same, but as much um to have like three or four fast sessions every week. I think that my body responds best on that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it doesn't have to be that that hard to plan the training because if I look at the my cross country skiing friends and that cult culture, you see that many of them are like having a a big part of the summer like training way too much and they then they don't like get up and get in shape towards the season so i think that for me it has been important to listen to the body and do like when you have the chance then train really really hard and then need take uh like a week of easier training and then go on with it again and try to to uh, fit it into the competition uh, schedule all right uh, so <clears throat> I, I, I was taking my mental notes. So she's ha she has one week free during one the whole year. She must be a robot. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> but, but, but then you like... but then but then you mentioned that you do, you do listen to your body and you try to balance it. And... I, and that's something I've learned during the years. And I mean, I'm still just twenty, so I'm not I'm not training that much uh, now. I think that I have a lot of hours left to do it during a year before I really need that that season break because still it's not of course my body can be tired but I always think it's so fun to do so I just I just do it because it's fun and then it's hard to to sit still <laughs> yeah so she's also young <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> regenerates fast <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. So, but but one thing also that you said um, helps me explain it in my head at least. You said that the most important competitions are somewhere towards uh, uh, February, March, right? So exactly. you can you can still take it quite easy uh, preparing, um, and you don't have to push hard from the very very beginning because there is, as, at least as you said, nothing important like in December, for example. No, exactly. And okay. I mean, this winter we had some um, selection races in. Uh, I think it was in the middle of uh, January. Mm -hmm. So then I took a uh, easy week before that. And uh, then I could train like, okay, then now we have three weeks until the next selection race. Then I can go hard for two weeks and then take one week rest. So yeah. you need to be like aware of what's in front of you. Sure. Um, by the way, do you have a coach or do you plan your own training sessions? Yes, I have a coach. Uh, or I can say that I have two coaches, one here when I where I live in Fallen and one uh, uh, from home. That actually was my first orienteering uh, coach. So he's still uh, still with me. He's still involved. Awesome. How, how is the cooperation between them? It's quite new because I moved to Fallen for like 
some months ago just uh, so but they knew they knew each other from earlier so it uh, it works really well and then uh, Klaus that's at home uh, in Lula he helps me with setting the schedule for every week and month or so and then uh, you one that's here in Fallen he he more see me every day and try to see how I I mean I I think you can see on me when I'm uh, having too much training or when I'm happy and satisfied and can go for more uh, it's quite uh, easy to see on me you're smiling less yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> screaming more and smiling less <laughs> okay <laughs> all right well lucky you lucky you to have two coaches I, I'm so uh, so happy with that they are it's working so far it works really really well nice to hear it um all right let me see um yeah the next one is are you going to continue doing both sports parallelly uh, mm, and, and what yes. do you think what do you think about your future are you thinking about focusing on one discipline a little bit more in the future or, mm. or is, how, how do you see it now because of course it might change in the future but i guess you're at the point where you need to make some uh, more focused decisions yes i i agree the i think that uh, the focus is now and has the last years been orienteering and the older i i will be the more i need to train on that too uh, but I guess at the same time, the cross country skiing will always be a big part of my training because it can uh, prevent me from having injuries and can help me to rehab when I have injuries. So I think you need to to always have that in mind that it has helped me to be as good as I am right now, and then it can't be that bad. It, I think uh, it's a good good idea to keep it. Yeah, I, I, um, honestly, I think so as well uh, too. Especially since you said you, you live uh, you live in the north of Norway, so you get a lot of snow, and it's hard to go and do a quality running session with all this. Snow. Exactly, it's for me the quality of the training are the most important thing you have. I mean, if if I can't do it concentrated or at a good way, it's it's no idea I do it. Then I can do something else. And when you have like in Lula where I live before, we had snow until May. And when the, um, and then you can't like think that you're gonna do a really good running session in in April. You need to be like realistic. Yeah. All right. Um, I also make a side note. So my wife was when I was asking her if she has any questions to you, she said that uh, I have I have to uh, help my wife her figure out how to convince convince her coach that the cross-country skiing is important and she absolutely should be doing it during winter. So Mary, if you're watching this and you, and you probably are, she said that it prevents injuries. So take this away with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I actually have, before we go, go into those smaller questions, I actually have one more than, uh, that came to my mind while we were talking. Uh, so at one side, you're a very competitive person. At the other side, injuries happen. How do you handle injuries uh, when, when they do happen? It, it, it's usually very tough for people like you. Yes, this was the first time for me that it was that I had an injury mm -hmm. during the uh, our competition season because I had one when the COVID came. Uh, I started to train too much. I think I, I was not alone doing that. Uh, but it was it was hard to handle it. But at this time, I when I went home from from a uh, book uh, in Denmark, I decided like, okay, uh, whatever happens this season, it doesn't matter. I want to look forward to next season. Uh, I I took a note for myself like, okay, how long time do I have until the next season, or to the selection races to book? Okay, it's in April, so I have a lot of time. And then I went home. I put a off my phone or turned off the social media and all that happened in Denmark to just focus on okay what what can I do as good as possible today and I can't say that I had was this focused and structured rated every day because I had my mental breakdowns uh, almost every night so but try to wake up and then realize that okay this is what I can um, affect today and then I try to do that all right. Yeah, it sounds very adult. But uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> but I think that's important to have that mental breakdown downs between these good moment moments too, because you have you to process it. Yeah, exactly. You can't have it inside all the time, and it's important to have like people around you that um, that are helping you with these mental breakdowns. Like 
my brother that he has seen them for me like from from he was uh, like so young so he knew how i work he, he know how i how i work <laughs> yeah yeah I, I totally agree with everything you've said uh good job hannah's brother thank you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. i was saying thank you <laughs> and, and to, to watch this <laughs> All right, so uh, now I have some shorter questions uh, from um, people. Um, the first one is from Michal or Michael. What's your favorite distance in foot orienteering and why? So I'm talking about long sprint, middle. Uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind, if you th think the forest disciplines, the middle distance is, is my uh, number one favorite. That's what uh, I would guess. Uh, yes, and, it's and be like before, a... you, before you answer, I would say that it's because it's the most challenging one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you. I want it to be as hard as possible, <laughs> yeah. all the way to the finish. <laughs> yeah. So, I... uh, like when you can run, like you are so tired, but you need to think on your highest level uh, at the same time. That's yes. I love it. <laughs> and you, you kind of you can get even higher speed in sprint, but at the same time, orienteering is way easier in sprint. Uh, between yes, the but I think that sprint has another charm too. Uh, so I, during the spring when I was uh, very much into the sprint, I loved it so much because it's so intense. Yeah, uh, I, I actually thought that you will struggle a little bit with this question because you tend to be doing very well on all of the distances really. Uh, but uh, based on, on our talk so far, I thought that you would pick middle. <laughs> yeah exactly but but the sprint is uh, a favorite too because it's so yeah it's so intense like i mentioned earlier okay uh next one is from jude what's uh, your go-to meal for an important race oatmeal of course it's uh, every swede's uh, answer but uh, i think it's it's nice because it doesn't taste so much and uh, you you doesn't get hungry so fast because i want to eat quite many hours before the race uh, to to have that uh, nice feeling in the stomach when you go uh, for a start, and when if you eat oatmeal, you don't get hungry then. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's quite popular. Simone Abersold said the same thing. Um, we are eating the same thing, and I all, actually I just remember right now the one time we were at the competition in Sweden. I think it might have been Baltic Junior Cup, and uh, we got we got the porridge for breakfast. Wait, you said oatmeal. Is, is it? Do you mean porridge or do you mean oatmeal with milk? Uh, oh, I don't know the, the difference actually, but the oats with the uh, cooked in water, yes, cooked or, in. and yeah. salt, and so, then you so, have so milk okay. on it. <laughs> so that so that's porridge. But yeah. but that's where I was going. You you eat it with salt, don't you? Yeah, uh, we do. That, that's don't? something. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it doesn't taste anything if you don't have the salt. But that's it what, does. I'm going I mean. With. I mean, it, it does if you put a little bit of uh, banana inside and, and then uh, cut some fruits on top of it when, when it's already cooked. So it can be really tasty, but it was a really surprise. I, I, I think this, is, this, is, this was the first time when I ate porridge that was salty in Sweden. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I understand that, Chuck. <laughs> that's surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But when, when I'm at home, I eat uh, porridge for breakfast every day at home too. Uh, and uh, then, then we use, like, I have a banana and I have some mango and... Uh, uh, peanut butter and that's uh, yeah. <laughs> the best time of the day <laughs> all right awesome next one is from josh how many hours or kilometers per week do you train mm, uh, i don't count kilometers because it's so different because of uh, or with uh, yeah which, so i know uh, that some people count kilometers some people prefer to count it in hours so that's why uh, exactly I and i i both. choose hours and that's also depending a lot of when it's in time but between 10 or 23, 24 hours. That's a, that's a big, yeah, uh, big span, yes. <laughs> big yeah, span it is. Uh, but that if, you, uh, if you have a competition, you don't do more than 10 to 12 hours because you want to, to be in shape. But yeah, yeah, uh, if I have a, a tough weekend or week in the winter, it can be about 20 hours. Nice. Uh, Samantha, what's your favorite training session? Oh, it's, oh that's our one. <laughs> uh, but I think that the one you do 
now in the autumns when the leaves are like all the colors and uh, do a long running session now it's amazing uh, but intervals are always a favorite uh, i was guessing in session. my mind and i thought you will pick intervals <laughs> yes <laughs> track sessions are are nice you don't get tired more tired than uh, them okay uh from samuel where would you like to live if you could pick any place in the world Right now, I think where I live in Fallen are the best place. I think it's it's a bit too far to the family. It's like nine hours driving or something, uh, but it's it's a wonderful place. But okay, now I need to, to change my answer. The uh, where we was in uh, like Switzerland and Italy, it's in the Alps. It's in the mountains. It's magical. Yeah. But they, these are very, very, um, definitely very beautiful. Uh, I've been to both, and yeah, the views are amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I guess the mountains in Sweden are not that big, right? No, they aren't. We have like the highest peaks at two thousand meters, and that's uh, way lower than the, than Switzerland as well. Yeah, but at the same time, I think you might have, especially in the north, more areas that are really more wild with less population i think yes it, it's hard it's, to find places really like this in europe uh, a lot of not that many that lives per like uh, area so uh, and yeah. like kilometer or so and now you said you live nine hours away from your birth town but that's like to the south exactly so i live for it's i think two three hours to stockholm so do, during winter uh, in your hometown, how much sun do you get during the day? It's easy to count. <laughs> Isn't it depressing? It's, a, it's not many hours. <laughs> Isn't it depressing? We, yeah, we... No, it's, it's what we are used to. We still get some uh, some hour, I think. So uh, it's not like in Kiruna that it's four hours driving even north of uh, Lula, where it's black all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm the person that runs on sun, so <laughs> I can't, yeah, but I can't imagine I think that. You, you need to sleep. I reflect that you need to sleep more during the winter up in Luleå, because I think you're more tired. So uh, uh, it's maybe something to, to have in mind. Yeah, all right. Um, last one, I think, from Astrid. What's your motivation for sports in general, I guess? Mm, the the competitive part and the, that I love doing it. It's the best thing I know. So it, it gives you a lot of pleasure in life. Yeah, and a lot of satisfaction. pleasure and a lot, a lot of like energy. Cool, perfect. All right, that's all I have for you, Hannah. Do you have any questions for me? No, nothing that comes to my mind right now, but. I'm impressed of your, I'm still stuck in your goals for like uh, uh, the the championships. Uh, it's uh, it's nice to hear that someone thinks thinks as me. So it's uh, a pleasure to hear. <laughs> uh, it's it's definitely not that big, as big as your goals. I mean, I didn't but, ask but about uh, your yeah, goals. I think it is because every, everyone's goal is the, has, has the same value. Everyone right, that, that's an interesting point of view. That's an interesting point of view. So, since we, we are at this topic, what are your goals? Um, my goal is to be the best I can be uh, during the whole life. Like, I mean, like, uh, if I can, if I reach my top level as an athlete in 10 years, then I will work hard until I get, get there. And um, if you, of course, it's next year to, to be able to, uh, first of all, take it come to to book uh, it's not the easiest when you're in the swedish team and uh, then uh, if i manage to do it run really really fa fast there that's my closest goal okay what what if um, you finish your athlete career what then um i, I don't know actually right now i'm so focused on it but uh we should see. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a long time away, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> I will but do this for a long time. <laughs> I, I kind of get the feeling that you will find something else that passion, passionates you. 
I, I uh, think so too. Um, yeah. uh, and you will also push as hard as possible towards that. Absolutely, I will. <laughs> cool. It's it's good to hear. I think that our world is richer having people uh, with that kind of mindset with us. They help everybody else get further. So thank you very much for taking the time and having a chat here. I think it's been really, really awesome. So for everybody that, that's been watching and if you stayed until the very end, if you have anything to comment on uh, this wonderful chat, just let us know in a comment. Uh, leave the like, subscribe to the channel if, you, if you're not already. And yeah, I will see you in some next videos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much.